So. I made a mistake in how I set up this uh, call because I created it there, in Zoom. You have two options, uh, or at least the you know, plan that we have has two options. One is to create a regular meeting, and the other is to create a webinar. And the difference being that a webinar has panelists and attendees, and attendees don't get on live video until they're promoted. Uh, whereas a meeting is simply anybody who shows up is automatically on the video. So I made a mistake and, and, and people may be coming in as attendees who will need to be promoted to panelists. So um, just a note, a technical note uh, there. Hello, everybody. I don't hear you all either. So I think probably there's also an auto mute kind of functionality. There you are. You can hear us now? Loud and clear. Great, Good. thanks. At How least you. <laughs> TJ, a bit, a bit, volume's a bit low again. That low again? <sighs> All right. Let's try, how's that? I think I know I what can, you mean <laughs> I'd like to give it a few minutes anyway, because um, there might be a couple of other people joining us and I want to stay attentive. How is everyone? Good. Good. Haven't read all of Slaughter Dick, but uh, <laughs> read the prologue. <laughs> okay. How about how about you, John and TJ? Have you read any of the? I started. I started it today. I got up to I think um, not up to the Parmenides section. So that's uh, I got up to se page seventy. Okay. Was, oh, wow. Um, no, I'm I'm I got up to uh, Anthropic Climate. Did you read that part? Access. Yes. Yes, and if I had known that I was going to get the entire point of bubbles in five pages there, I might have saved myself some reading time. <laughs> well, that that gives me something to be motivated. Yeah, by. it's a very. <laughs> Wait, what 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 pages? Is, is uh, that, my, you on. you been past the uh, what was required today, right? Starts on page one thirty five of my translation. Okay, great. Well, required is a strong word. It, it, we vacillated, I think, and we've been a bit ambivalent. Uh, well, usually I'm, I'm very, I'm overly ambitious and read ahead, but I decided not to do that. So I'm a little bit behind. I'm going to be a tortoise this time. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's fine. I, in an email I sent out yesterday, suggested that if folks who might want to join us you know, didn't even begin reading that they could join us and we could incorporate them into the dialogue somehow. So, but maybe nobody will. Uh, I'll give it another minute. Uh, uh, a person named Heather Fester, a friend, uh, also signed up and I don't know if she's going to attend tonight or not. Uh, but she actually, she's a, she lives locally or uh, used to uh, and is a poet, uh, just completed a, a degree or a program at Naropa University in the poetics program there. Before that had been uh, um, a student of rhetoric. Wow. And then I think her, her, her thesis or her PhD on rhetoric. She's also a Gebser and is pre presented at uh, one of the Gebser conferences. And so it would be wonderful did? if she joined us because- Re Recently? Uh, last one? The, the 2016. Oh. Uh, so I would love it if she joined us um, because I think she'd add a really interesting perspective uh, to this. And, and she's been kind of in a um, uh, p place last we connected of exploring sort of post post modern philosophies, alternative integral type philosophies and looking for, I guess, th maybe theoretical diversity or meta theoretical diversity. Perhaps well, I have a book I could, su could suggest, which I, which was triggered by this uh, 
reading this chapter, he talks about um, Atlas a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and I just read this, Prometheus and Atlas, by, and this guy's Jason Reza Giorgiani. Have you ever heard of him? No. He's very intense. He's um, Jeffrey Kripal has. I read this book because Jeffrey Kripal liked it, and uh, because he's talking about the superhuman potential. So mm -hmm. he's very in that Aurobindo futurist kind of um, actualizing this um, sort of hidden potential in humanity. He also talks about the paranormal and, and also about Heidegger. Mm. His idea is that Atlas and Prometheus are the most important figures for our time, that we need to drop Jesus, been through that, we've done that. We need to now start getting very Promethean. <laughs> mm. So he has a... Definitely, and he comes from an Iranian culture, so he comes from Zarathustra. Talks a lot about Nietzsche as well, and I know you're a fan of Nietzsche. Mm -hmm. So I think he's sort of um, uh, maybe one of those alternative people to. You know, he's also, I understand, he's on the he's a the alternate right. He's a real right winger. Mm -hmm. So I think that makes him a very odd character. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Speaking of the monstrous. Um, I don't think anybody else is going to join us, so why don't we begin? And I thought I'd begin with an anecdote, uh, which may or may not go anywhere in particular. <laughs> but that's part of what I want to investigate and part of what I hope we could you know, put our minds together around. Uh, so I went to Denver yesterday and uh, met up with Caroline. We had a meeting, uh, essentially a business-type meeting, talking about Cosmos uh, Cooperative and working on essentially a modeling proce process around what that could look like. Uh, we were calling it the viable baby. And so she's written a bunch of material that she's looking forward to sharing and to um, inviting others into a, a dialogic process in, um, in developing that model. So we, we did that meeting and I won't go into it, but uh, when we left, uh, we I happened to be we happened to be in Denver, and we were at the Denver Public Library, which uh, is just near the Civic Center, and it's just near a, a large park called Civic Center Park, and it's kind of the you know the the heart of of Denver in terms of its governance and in terms of just the the crossing of populations, so the politicians, the homeless folks, tourists, etc. And I had been. Um, uh, alerted uh, by uh, someone that there was a, a exhibition of a, sculpt a set of sculptures by the Chinese artist uh, Ai Weiwei in the Civic Center Park, and it's uh, the sculpt. It's the Chinese zodiac, twelve animals of the Chinese zodiac in large uh, sculptures, kind of you know centered around, around um, you know, one edge of the park. And so I thought, well, I'm there. Let me let me go see it. So after I said bye to. Uh, Caroline and, and her friend Draft, uh, I moseyed to the park, and as I was walking, I noticed, oh, look, we do have another uh, participant, and it's Duggins. Hey. Hi, Doug, welcome. I was just telling a story, and you've come just at the, at the, at the poignant moment, um, because as I was walking, uh, through the park to go see Ai Weiwei's uh, exhibition, uh, I noticed a, a sphere uh, just kind of off to the side. Uh, and it was a, a globe, very much like the globes that are depicted in, in the book, globes. Uh, and as I approached it to investigate it, I, I noticed that there was a man in the middle of the sphere. And this man actually had four faces. So it was kind of like a double Janus. Uh, and they were facing the four you know, directions um, longitudinally, horizontally on the sphere. And as I, as I looked at the plaque, I saw that it was a, a sculpture of Christopher Columbus. And so Christopher Columbus is inside of this globe, uh, which like uh, you know, we're going to read about or we have read about is this perfect orb, which in the globalized world that we're in now, we are essentially living within. Uh, and so... I, w I looked at it, I took a few pictures and noted, you know, the, the uh, serendipity <laughs> of the encounter and then went and, and looked at Ai Weiwei's pictures 
uh, or sculptures, uh, which were much more central in the topog in, in the spatial distribution of this park. They were the highlight. Uh, and the globe was actually kind of off to the side, was in, I noticed. And then I, I, I caught the, the bus home and I read, uh, I read the introduction uh, on the way home. And things started to click as to, well, a number of things have been clicking as I've been reading. But the kind of what, what I think I learned or what I noted at least from the experience was that what I think Sloterdijk is talking about is not just an idea. It's something that we're actually living in in some sense. And what he means by ontology and how ontology relates to uh, being in the world, being with others, and um, being in a, 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 a life or an ensouled space uh, is kind of what is at stake in this, in this reading. And this figure of the golden orb, the golden ball, that has, is kicked around from thinker to thinker, and the matter of concern that that is, like that, that's, I think, part of what began to connect for me uh, and to make the reading meaningful, that there is a matter of concern. It's not just an idea. It's not just that, that globe that the philosophers have at their feet. Uh, we have to think our way into it. And that's, I think, what I, where I have kind of ended up um, or kind of where I'm at in this moment as we're like, as we're converging to have this conversation. Uh, so I wanted to share that just to start because it, I've been a little bit anxious about what, like, what are we going to do with this? <laughs> you know, it's a lot of reading. I have these two books and they're huge. They're heavy. You know, I carried one of, I carried this, this thing like Atlas with me in my backpack <laughs> All the way to Denver and back. And you just feel like you're pushing the rock up the mountain, right? <laughs> That's Sisyphus, yeah. <laughs> so, so I kind of want to get our minds around, like, what is the matter of concern? Like, why are we doing this, really? And, and, how, and, and how, does, how does it relate, like, to, to, what, to, to our spheres of concern? Uh, and I don't have the answer to that exactly. I have, I think, some ideas, but, but the ideas are, are a kind of jumble and a swirl. Uh, and I, I don't know how to fixate them without t connecting it to your ideas. And so uh, I'm very curious about how this will go. Uh, and I'm open to being surprised. <laughs> I was thinking it's interesting that you were talking about um, uh, a globe at a, an exhibition because yesterday I went to a art launch uh, for a, one of my friends, but it was at a collective art launch. And one of the other artists was presenting bronze globes. So globes, again, they're sort of runic globes with sort of symbols on them, but in solid bronze, which is, they're such a weighty, you know, they're small globes. They're about this big, but they're still, they weigh a ton. <laughs> so <laughs> you could switch out Sloterdijk's volume for one of these bronze globes. <laughs> <laughs> It's interesting how you start seeing them everywhere and how uh, the kind of power of suggestion primes the mind to uh, notice uh, what you otherwise might completely overlook. And the, the, uh, just, Sorry to go on. Um, this idea of ontology is really interesting um, because I've been working in my research in ontological issues for a number of years. And I tended to think of it as this idea of 
a theory of the nature of things or a theory about what things are. So the, what thing, you know, the idea of what things, things are being, and then what are be, what is being. So the nature of being as being what an ontology is. But then I encountered this colleague uh, of mine and she was using the word in a totally different way. And she's a musician. And I, at first, I didn't understand the way she was talking about it. But then we had a discussion about it. And she, because she was using ontology as being, you have an ontology for, each of us has an ontology for our lives. Hmm. So it's an ontology at the individualized level, rather than this sort of global theory about the nature of things. And, but she said, that's still ontology. Ontology is the nature of things as much in their individuality as in their generality, if you like. So that there's this whole approach to ontology that is very general, but there's another approach to ontology. And I think you see this a little bit in Slutter Dick where he slides between the general and the individual to some extent. So there's a, this idea of we each have an ontology. Hmm. It's very interesting. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> we each have an ontology. I don't think I do. <laughs> 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 Mine's quite evasive, elusive. I think I have, um, I'm sort of, um, this talk about being always drives me crazy because I'm very aware of becoming. Um, but I've never been, but I find the whole topic of being to be very boring. I don't want to be, I want to become. Of course, I know there's a deep relationship and there's a, but I'm very attracted to becoming. I like Whitehead and process philosophy and, you know, Aurobindo and Bergson, that, that on the move uh, kind of a uh, spirit. Um, motivates me and um, I get from so I know a lot of you guys have followed Heidegger and I I've, I just find that snooze time <laughs> just can't get into it <clears throat> but anyway that's so my that's my thing and I, I've always like ontology what the hell is everyone talking about I'm I'm fascinated by epistemology I think there are different types uh, different kinds of philosophy that interest you and and definitely I'm very drawn to epistemological questions and how do you know this? Um, so I know there's re re deep relationships between ontology and epistemology. One can't, you can't have one without the other, as Gregory Bateson used to say. But anyway, I'm wondering, my big question as I started to approach this, and what I like the most about Schlauderdijk are his titles. The, the chapters, the titles really get my attention. Reminds me of uh, Wallace Stevens in that way. You know, those wonderful poetic titles, you know, the emperor of ice cream, you know, those kinds of things. And um, I wondered what the monstrous is here. The monstrous, uh, what he talks about geometry. Um, and it, it, that really sort of the project of the, the geometry and the monstrous. And I, the only... In, in the little bit that I've read, he, may, he some, makes mention of the, the monstrous in the Dionysian theater, <clears throat> sort of contrasting that with the, the serenity of the, you know, the, the, the gentleman philosophers, you know, in, in front of the gates of the, the city, sort of in that grove, you know, out, outside of the city walls. And it's that sort of serene circle, he, he, he does a, a lovely scene. Uh, he creates a wonderful setting, I think. He's looking at that uh, mosaic, that famous mosaic, the Torre Annunziata. Um, <clears throat> so I really like that about him, His um, how he'll dwell on an art object and he'll just sort of free associate with it for a while and then he'll move on to something else. Sort of, I always feel like he's like a, a guide in a museum and sort of gives you a, a like he's a, a, a docent in a museum, sort of brings out an artifact and knows everything in the world about it. So I think that's very fascinating. To me, he's sort of, I, I, you may disagree with me, TJ, but I feel like he's a, more of like a cultural analyst than like a philosopher who's presenting arguments. You know, I don't, I've never found an argument yet 
and what I've been <laughs> worried. But there's one there. It's so subtle that it's over my head, um, which is what I'm used to. When you know, when I go to a philosopher, I'm I'm studying the argument, and I can't find one here. He's very elusive, and I think he's he's definitely into the mythological and the and the magical as well. Uh, but I think his his attitude is very detached and um, definitely um, an observer. He seems to favor the observer mode. Um, I don't see him as a, a Nietzschean kind of get down into the, <laughs> you know, and, <laughs> and um, embody the warrior or anything. So, and I think he has a very, um, he's a storyteller, sort of a, a magician type. I mentioned that earlier that I, in the previous reading that I thought he had a strong magician kind of energy uh, or a wizard energy. But the downside, you know, the dark side of the magician is deception, self-deception. Mm -hmm. You can create wonderful stories that go nowhere, except they keep people entertained. And I think that's his, his strength. And, str and strangely enough, I think that's one of his weaknesses. I mean, I should talk. <laughs> I would love to tell stories that go nowhere. But, you know, but actually, when I do tell stories, or an antidote, I usually do have a point. Maybe a subtle point, or even a stupid point, but there's a point to it, and I and I sometimes don't know what the point to his his anecdotes are. So that's just my response. I and I've actually got the opposite impression oh, from okay. what I read in Globes, and that it's just you know my reading of it. This is refreshingly direct compared to Bubbles. Oh, yeah. I agree. Um, I think. Well, he. I don't know. <laughs> call it an argument or not. He's, sla he's slapping philosophy down left and right. Uh, what was a, uh, had a couple of really good quotes that I just really liked from it. Um, the learned Scola sworn to a communitary enthusiasms. It will in future be held together by an anachronistic turn of phrase, problem awareness that removes them from all other human groups. Like these guys are, you know, they have to come away from the concerns of the city. They have to come out of life pretty much to sit and talk about this object at their feet. And he, right. and he goes on, he makes a couple of other um, observations that, you know, philosophy has just kind of distanced itself from, from real life concerns in order to create the symbol of the one and encompass everything. And I think that you were talking about the monstrous, that's just, a, a, an attempt to mentally encompass this, the unencompassable. And he's but, they're very, focused, but they're focused on being, I mean, that's a big topic for these the, philosophers. Yeah, they're, they're, they're focused on trying to comprehend it. And Slaughter Dyke is saying that, you know, they're more or less successful with that. <laughs> Hey, uh, I want to see if Duggins could could say hi. I have some thoughts, but uh, but uh, he hasn't. This is his first time on a, a call on the, this book, and I'm curious uh, where he's got with it and and how he's approaching it since we've all we've all gone around. Hey, Doug. Hello. So uh, it's hey. nice to put a couple more faces to the the words i've seen written on uh infinite conversation so hello jeffrey and uh tj um, <laughs> hey doug how you doing <laughs> all right i i do not actually have this book so i ca i came as kind of an outsider kind of wanting to jump in at some point i i feel like i might possibly be able to um start with this second book um, as opposed to start at the beginning, we'll we'll see what happens. But no, I'm just here to kind of listen, and um, I I like the comment you made, Jeffrey, about um, the different take of ontology. I'm I'm not too familiar with philosophy uh, up, up until this last year, and ontology has kind of been my my go-to philosophy in general. Um, I started with uh, Tillich, Paul Tillich. Um, who, who's a theologian, but he's also um, quite a philosopher uh, once you get down to it, which uh, he, he goes into the ontology of 
quite a bit of things. I, this week I had to present um, a book called Love, Power, and Justice, which has uh, been to the honor. And as uh, your friend noticed, Jeffrey, uh, it, it's everyone has their own ontology to a certain extent. There's the kind of academic term, and then there's the, the being of each individual. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm just here hanging out. <laughs> So, Doug, um, I'm curious. Like, what would be? Uh, I mean, you're almost you're almost kind of representing this outside monstrous perspective that Sutterdyke, uh, you know, is pointing to with this idea of the sphere and what's beyond the, the conceived sphere. But also, it's useful to have an observer in a, in a way because, uh, you know, we're kind of, because you, you know, we're in something that you're not yet and mm-hmm. so we're and we're having a conversation which might make no sense like we might just really have a certain kind of we might be kind of talking intellectual gibberish uh and someone with you know that isn't uh absorbed into uh those thought forms uh could potentially you know give a reflection like can you clarify that or you know, how does that relate to something else that I'm understand natively um, outside of this particular discourse? So I just want to, you know, invite you to uh, participate, even if you don't feel like you've read, uh, by helping to like reflect back, you know, what we might not be seeing. Because I actually want to get to something in, in the conversation. Like, I don't want to just be like, you know, the entertain, entertaining ourselves. And I had this experience reading this reading Globes, particularly it came with the introduction because after the prologue, I had this, I felt a bit, um, what was it? I, I, I wrote about this on the, on the forum. I felt uh, intrigued, but uh, a little bit disappointed in a way because it seemed that what, what, what Sloterdijk was setting up was this kind of elitist, um, distant, uh, objectivizing type of, um, you know, uh, scenario. Uh, and he, you know, I noticed that he started this second book much in the same, on the same note as he started the first book. Uh, if, we're, if you recall, the beginning of Bubbles uh, is a, a meditation on the you know, the saying uh, uh, at the entrance to Plato's Academy uh, and the way that Sloterdijk tells it, like, let no one enter here who's not a, a geometer. And so there's this idea of a special society, a special group of people who understand something about the nature of reality that no, nobody no else does. <laughs> and this recurs now in uh, at the beginning of Globes because we're presented with the scenario through the mosaic that John... You, you referenced the Annunciata, the, uh, I should Torre, Torre Annunciata, Torre Annunciata. <laughs> which, which is the, depicting a, um, a you know, classical scene involving seven philosophers, seven sages. They're all bearded men uh, who, like you said, are outside of the city, outside of the market, and who've gathered together to have what Sloterdijk describes as a serious conversation, a very serious conversation about this object that's before them uh, and they're pointing to with their rods and they're discussing. And they, he, he describes this scene curiously, I thought, but then it made sense as a Pentecostal religious kind of scene. Uh, it's not just that they're, you know, just having a leisurely debate, but there's a sense of, of transfixion, transfixation by what they've touched into with this notion of there being a measurable shape uh, that they could lo- locate themselves within. And that more than that, that described what I think is the point and the, the matter of concern, which I, 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 I got, very clearly than in the introduction. And that's this sense of the whole, the whole or the all, the everything, the 
uh, what uh, the, you know, the nameless in a certain sense, like what that is. When we talk about being and the relation between thinking and being and that golden ball that's being kind of thrown from philosopher to philosopher and the, the, the uh, inscription at the beginning of the book, quoting Nietzsche about the, the golden ball, how Zarathustra, how I'd love to see you play with the, you know, play with the golden ball. So what is that golden ball? Well, that's a figure, but it's, it's has this manifestation in these philosophers thoughts and in the history of Western metaphysics as this one all encompassing orb, which now in the modern and postmodern age has collapsed into um, you know, an infinitude of self referential you know, microspheres. This is the foam that we're getting to. And this is kind of like describing taking the subway or taking the bus or going anywhere in the world. Everybody's in their own world, essentially. Everybody has their own ontology. And, and their own cell phone. <laughs> yeah, right. And their own reality and their own virtual all-encompassing reality is where we're going with this, right? So what I see Sloterdijk doing here is telling a story, but also I think trying to think into, and I, I hate to just kind of lapse into Heideggerian jargon or something like that, but to think into what was lost from that sense of there being a center that's not your personal self. And how could that be recovered in a certain way? This is where I think this could go. How could that be recovered in a way that's not totalizing in the mode of Western metaphysics, but at the same time isn't totally atomizing in the mode of the form of post-modernity. And I don't know, like, we're not there yet. Like this is, this volume of uh, Sloterdijk says is what he calls him. He calls it a mausoleum, John. <laughs> you, he, yes. And, yes and you'll get, yeah. well, you'll get to that. Uh, and he's parading forth or just exhibiting uh, the, a, a kind of record of expired or collapsed spheres, uh, which in, in, is painting the picture of what comes now, of where we're at, where we are now, which he calls the monstrous, because the, the monstrous is the space beyond the conceived sphere. And it's the inability, the absolute inability to construct a perfect sphere that contains everything. Uh, so it's kind of the, you know, it's, 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 it could be disturbing. And I think there's a mad, he talks about the madness too, like the centripetal madness. Centripetal. There, there is a, I'm not going a, mad by the way. There, there is a reference to the monstrous that comes to mind too, because when, um, so I'm trying to think who the philosopher it was Riemann or Punk Poincaré when they came out with the idea that you can have parallel lines converge that meet. Yeah. That was considered to be monstrous by the mathematicians of the time. And then it became the defining geometry for Einsteinian physics and space time. And so it became the monstrous became the de facto reality in which we live. And so I'm sure Sloterdijk is aware of that reference in behind. I suspect so, anyway. I, I, I'm, I'm curious about that too, Jeffrey. I, isn't it, it violated uh, some axiom in Euclid? It, it was the fifth axiom of Euclid, yeah. which said that parallel lines can't meet. Right, and so you have that, uh, all those alternative geometries, which yeah. now, you know, makes Euclid look really very static, <laughs> to say the least. And I think that's where a lot of the static being <coughs> to be uh, a product of this kind of uh, Euclidean geometry, which they all knew very well, mm. as did our founding fathers. You know, they based the Constitution, all men are created equal. Um, mm. like a, it's like a Euclidean axiom. <clears throat> but I'm, I'm just curious about this uh, obs- almost obsession with the orb and the globe. Because, um, I mean, I understand that, but we've been also talking about 
topology and other kinds of topological figures, um, like the Mobius strip and the limnoscate and the the, uh, the torus and the um, the one I love is the Klein bottle, and it just seems to me that um, they have a different kind of uh, quality than the the non orientable nature of of the globe, and I there's something else you said something else Marco about you know everyone being in their own little bubble and um, everyone has their own reality. And I'm remembering something that uh, Carrie Weld said about everyone has their own reality and then there's consensus reality, but no one lives in the consensus reality. But we all pretty much know what it is. I mean, we, we can engage with the consensus reality. Uh, you know, when we, politics seems to be very involved in that and so does our, our education and medicine, you know, there's a consensus reality. Um, but like she said, that's not where any of us live. So I think that's what's lost. That's what I think people are losing a grip on is, is, the cons is a consensus. Um, so we're all getting more and more just self-referential and, um, and we find others who, you know, will share, share the, some of their attention with us, but most of the attention they share with us is not a very high quality. It's pretty fragmented. And um, so I think um, it's, it's troubling. And so my interest is in the intersubjective, um, which is not the same thing as, as a consensus reality. It's when um, two or more are gathered together. And then what happens? Um, and that, that I think is very difficult to measure uh, or to quantify in a way that would render it, uh, a, a give it a consensus um, that we could all point to something objective that we measured together and we can say that's, um, that's the real. So anyway, that's what, what I'm perplexed by and curious about is that inter intersubjectivity and how we can um, model like we've been doing recently and, and other forms, um, how we can model t each other's map of time. And um, strangely enough, even though we found out that we have different maps of time, we can, underst we can understand another person's map and actually be curious about it. But I think that's a, that's a very subtle kind of formal interviewing. It's a, it's a, it's a qualitative research and it's really focusing on the intersubjective but you have to have that right balance. And um, I find myself very frustrated by this text because it's so tantalizing. And I will read it, large sections of the previous book, and I've just started this one. And I agree, TJ, it's a lot more, um, it's a lot easier to follow. It's, yeah. It seems a lot less elusive, the little bit that I've read. Um, but I can't remember exactly where I wanted to go with this. Uh, so you'll have to pardon me. And I, think, I hope something, some of that made sense, but I found myself getting really frustrated because I would read large sections of it. And he's very, he's very conceptual, which is okay. Philosophers are doing that. <clears throat> um, but I never get a definition, not one. And he, he doesn't necessarily use, so he uses con concepts in a, in a they get fuzzier and fuzzier as he goes along. Um, so I sort of long for those definitions and some sort of uh, uh, rigorous argument. Um, You'll never get it in Slaughterdick, I think. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, a, I, so you rigorous asked, one. So what's my purpose here? You know, well, I have to, if I have to give that up, then I'm just going to say, oh, this is just sort of a, a nice, you know, a nice chatty guy, you know, in a museum, <laughs> you know, seems to know a lot about the stuff and I could certainly learn from him and, and be charmed by him. I think he's extremely enter entertaining. Um, but, you know, I would love to like, could you, uh, what exactly do you mean by that? <laughs> it, it, it will be interesting to have this conversation though, after, after everyone's gotten to read that section, Anthropic Climate, because like he, he went back and 
pulled in all the things that I was, I thought that I was kind of teasing out from his introduction in Bubbles and all the, the like Excursus 1 and Excursus 4 and Bubbles that just kind of made a little bit of sense because it did tie in with limits of transference and that strong relationship. And he just kind of explained it really well in that, in that last section. And uh, page 128, and he, he was talking about post-structuralist philosophy and how now, um, instead of seeking the essence of things, which is what these philosophers have been doing for the past you know, 2,000 years, um, it became about chasing the event and not letting the container and not letting the structure keep you from an understanding of the event. And sort of a way that like, um, Tim Ingold would also say, you know, the event is going on and you capture that. And Sloterdijk says... Um, that and other forms of philosophical thought are, quote, all forms of naivete that one loves because their naivete is that of philosophy itself, as if philosophy has kind of not caught the orb and just kind of missed the whole thing of, of, of being. And he goes on in that page to say he's after, again, quote, an ontology of the finite, inchoate, monstrous world. And this means creating an equilibrium between conservative and explosive elements. One could also call them psychological and technological interests, both in their respective radicalisms, which really struck me as a kind of integral thing to do. And what we were talking about the other day about taking the, the philosophical, theological and taking the technological phases and just kind of bringing that together. He's seeking something that will encompass that in replacing the one great orb of great orb of mystery, <laughs> what the philosophers were chasing for the past, you know, thousands of years. So there was something I noticed too, in reading this, uh, obviously the prologue, which is the part that I read is that he kind of, I mean, yes, like, um, you were saying, John, he, there is a continuity in the way that he's dealing with things. It's not that different from bubbles in some ways, but right. there is a kind of a, okay, guys, we've done bubbles. Now we're going to set the bubbles aside. And the other thing is about bubbles is it was all about spheres that were containing things. Right. But we start off globes with looking at the globe from outside it, not from inside it. And I think this, I think there's a clear effort on his part to move away from this englobing idea of spheres that one had from bubbles to something that is more exploded, more this distance, more, because um, bubbles was all about not distance. It was about having all this stuff up front in your face. Uh but now we're at something which is uh, the eclaté. I don't know how to say that in English. Um, oh, mashed together. <laughs> <laughs> Splat, I believe. <laughs> Eclat. <laughs> but he's. But it's not just looking at it like uh, he he makes the contrast between Atlas holding the thing and looking at it from the outside, and Parmenides, who's looking at the globe from or trying to get at get at it from the inside and but it's supposed to be some central point that illuminates the whole thing jeffrey froze on me here okay i see him moving mm -hmm. okay <laughs> there it is <laughs> he's looking at it from both inside and outside the the global the global sphere that's helpful that's helpful oh and thank you for elaborating on that a little bit because that gives me something to look forward to yeah. It's yeah, he, it, it, I'm just getting a sense. I'm just getting more of a sense that there's an actual point to this one, you know, and if, if, until I'm still, uh, Doug, if you still, if, if you don't read bubbles, Doug, just start with anthropic climate and globes and then go back and then just read globes. <laughs> <laughs> See, I'm starting to pick up on that, I suppose, but yeah, yeah. that was a good picture there, Jeff. Uh, so I, I like that image. So in the first book, we were inside the we were inside the the bubble and in the mother's womb, and we spent a lot of time in in there in the prenatal psychology, and now we're outside looking at the globe, and we're uh, we're looking at we have a different kind of relationship to it. Is that what you're saying in this new 
in this uh, well that's what i got from the opening section that it has yeah. a different feel to it that way yeah so it's more about political philosophy right we're moving and we're moving from individuals to society and and how it's organized and right it how it's been historicized yeah right. but slaughtered I, I think one of his points is that he's trying to say that there's a there is an understanding of, well, not even an understanding, but it's an experience of intimacy that happens in the microsphere with the bubble. I mean, you, you don't have any control over the womb you happen to emerge in, and that just kind of frames your, your being. And he's, I think he's saying that there's also a, that kind of communal thing going on on a larger scale. When, you know, as, you, as you're putting societies together, you're also kind of finding yourself in an atmosphere before, before you start making decisions about what the, the shape of your culture is going to look like. Moreover, I would I would say that he's saying that it's necessary to have some form of what he calls "quote unquote" air conditioning, and we could talk about why the the air is kind of an important uh, metaphor. Uh, it's important to have that so that you can have some form of solidarity, some form of witness in a population that that's 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 that large, and. Like part of what I think we're exa examining here in Globes is what that looks like at the level of an empire, like what that looks like when the globe is a totalizing being that's aiming for some perfect enclosure that doesn't that, that is trying to distance the monstrous as much as possible because every empire has Keep its, the barbarians out exactly. <laughs> um, but I think that it was important for him to start with bubbles because he wants to and he says this much to understand that intimate sphere as more prime primordial like like that when it when when it comes down to what matters to us it, it's shaped in those primary dyads and then from there it gets we transfer it you know to these larger spaces these larger spheres uh, that, you know, are rounded off in their various ways to, you know, as immuno immu immunological um, uh, membranes or functions. And uh, he ties us to being. Now, I want, I want to talk a bit, a, bit, a bit about being because I have a particular, I may, I may read some things in this book per, like more, pretty strongly. And it's because and I know that this is not the only this is not the only dimension of of his like of his dialogue here, but he's I think really in a conversation with Heidegger and Nietzsche and Plato, uh, and that I, I, that con that conversation like captured my kind of fascination or my my um, my mind when when I was in college. So the question of being. Uh, there was a time in my life when I was, you know, 20, young 20 something old man, where that question that, that was very, um, it was mind blowing kind of, and I, it, it, I almost had a moment kind of like he describes where you get a sense of what that really means, like the being of beings, or you have a, you may not be able to articulate it well, you, you know, are probably just um, going to sound like a, a uh, complete fool um, trying to talk about it, you know, like in a college dorm room, smoking pot or whatever, you know, it can easily lend itself to such conversations. At the same time, there was something that much like, again, like he, he uh, describes as a Pentecostal or a quasi a kind of religious experience I felt that, and uh, I was enamored of Heidegger and Nietzsche, and I spent many hours with my face buried in, in their books. I read Being in Time twice. I, uh, you know, I lost friendships and alienated my family, you know, <laughs> while uh, exploring these these thoughts. And uh, and so, I finally got the sense here in the introduction specifically that that's what he's talking about. Like he's, he's having that conversation that I was like initiated to into 
uh, through this event in my life. Um, and, and so the religious aspect of it, which he's very, you know, cool about, he's very, but it's there and yeah. he's, um, flat, you know, giving glimpses at, into it perhaps. You know, and, and he's always, am, he's always ambiguous. He's always going to take both sides. He's going to praise the sphere in a certain way, but he all, also is, basically doing a post-mortem on the sphere. So he's not advocating it. Mm-hmm. So, so then this sense that, that the, the, like, what's the center? What's your real kind of matter of concern? Where is that? Is it yourself as a personal ego? Is it your culture, your faith group, your institution, your country? Or is it, or is it God? And if it's God, how do you understand that relationship? And uh, is that God an enclosed God, or is that God an infinite God, whose center is everywhere and circumference is nowhere? And if that's the case, then is your God a monstrous God, <laughs> right? Like there, and if you're going to be in a relationship with that God or that meaning of being, or however you phrase it, then what does that require? Uh, because the spheres that he's talking about each have their kind of requirements to sustain them. Like there has to be something you do in a intimate relationship, in a village, in a, in a nation, what sustains the relationship between a self and the center of the of being as they see it. And, and that's kind of where I think, you know, you get to this eccentricity and epicentricity. And once people start thinking about that, then they, they don't really quite fit easily, like in lesser geometries. And so that sense of alienation from, or that sense of the philosophers kind of set aside or that, that elitism, there's something to that. And I, I'm uh, but it's, it's, uh, it's also a trap in, a, in another way. And I think Sloterdijk is kind of pointing at that, and, but he's ambiguous about it too. And I, I don't know exactly where I stand. Uh, I'm sort of feeling it out. And does that lead anywhere? <laughs> does that... yeah, a, I think we're all, well, as, as the argument goes forward, we'll see exactly what he's trying to point out. But I mean, for these philosophers to go, they, they have to kind of leave a sphere to go out and talk about a bigger sphere, don't they? Yeah. You know, even, maybe even leave this, the orb shape. Maybe begin, uh, you know, traveling in Mobius strips and Klein bottles. And, you know. Possibly. I was going to ask you, as I haven't read Heidegger, so I haven't read Heidegger, what do you think is the conversation he's having with Heidegger? It's it, it's between being and it's between time and space, and the relationship between, or or maybe how to put this, but in a sense, like what's more primary or what's more necessary to think, time or space? He's he's sort of like wants to think space. He wants to. Uh, foreground an experience of of uh beingness and and heidegger wanted to uh interpret being in terms of finitude and time so heidegger emphasized the being toward being toward death the being in the world Uh, and there's i think a sense in this conversation between them that that is a dead end that the that the the descending or the infinitizing current current to toward the world has to open up into a more and this even is part, kind of where Heidegger goes in his later thinking the so called turn into an op, into more of a sort of spacious openness i would say uh that seems to be what Sloterdijk is opening up is some kind of sense of spacious openness in, in the way that the way that we 
relate to being because that that I mean, that comes up in the quote that you uh, uh, read for us about the post-structuralists and this this way that they're still doing philosophy because that philosophy is even if they're deconstructing spatial structures, uh, they're still doing that almost driven by an impulse to further and further, further and further atomized being or further and further kind of get to a smaller and smaller thing. Uh, and what I'm getting in Sloterdijk is the sense that that process sort of plays itself out. And, and the logical re- end of the logic. <clears throat> yes. And then it's like space time. And maybe this is where like the non-Euclidean geometries would be useful. Like time almost like flips or inverts back into a spacious awareness because there isn't the anxiety as much anymore. There's another theme that Heidegger, you know, um, elaborated upon. He wrote an essay called what is metaphysics where um, he talks about this fundamental existential mood of dread, this sense what, and he asks, what does dread disclose? What's disclosed in that attunement, that mood, some that Soderdijk talks about in the air conditioning and that, that, that attunement, that mood discloses, he says, nothing, and nothing. Mm. And so the nothing is the, and this is not how Heidegger would put it, but kind of the driver of metaphysics. That's the monstrous, like that's the, the shadow of the metaphysical project. And it's sort of like this, the, the unreachable center of it around which everything turns. Right, okay. But that mood of anxiety and of, uh, Adam, fin- f- focus on finitude, I guess. Uh, maybe, maybe you know, he uh, ha- plays itself out. I guess is all you know. Uh, you could say. I mean, you eventually want to relax into being in some way. You eventually want to relax. <laughs> I, I, I think you can relax into being if you're well fed. You know where your next meal's going to come from. I mean, and I was, uh, I was, the neoliberal rhetoric was fine with me until the recession in, in 2008. And the business I worked for, they went under. And then there I was in my mid 50s without a job. And I was unemployed for three years. You know, I had to take the shittiest kind of work for $8 an hour. And I'm talking about lifting heavy boxes and going up and down five flights of stairs and walking through rat shit. <clears throat> so it really wakes you up because I hadn't had any, you know, I'd done pretty well. I could always, fo- you know, function. And um, I could also afford to, I had a lot of leisure, um, but I was up against it. I did recover from it to some extent, not psychologically, but I did recover financially to some extent. And, and went through a period of uh, relative prosperity. But, um, you know, that's sort of behind me now. And I have a, a new, you know, dealing with becoming an elder and what happens next. And um, I don't have any faith in this neoliberal, um, the, the report on the, the jobs and things are getting better. And um, this is the best of all possible worlds. You're hearing that stuff again. <clears throat> And I'm just wondering, what, what planet are these people on? Even if I'm not in a terrible situation, I've been in a terrible situation, and I identified strongly with those who were still in very terrible situations. Um, and, um, you know, that's why this stuff about being bores me out of my mind. <laughs> it just seems like something with people who have a lot of time on their hands to reflect upon, which most of these philosophers did. They had a lot of time on their hands. Almost all of them. <laughs> yeah, someone else is making, you know, making their, a cup of coffee for them or whatever. Or so it, is so there I'm any just, sense of urgency within? I have um, a great sense of urgency. Yeah. For, I, I understand that with you, but with Slaughter Dyke, is there any sense of urgency? Does, I'm not kidding. That, that seems to be where maybe the spatial metaphor is kind of reaching <laughs> out towards versus the time being in time kind of gives you an anxiety um, once you examine your life. So is Slaughter Dyke with these spatial metaphors, the spheres at this point, is he kind of 
taking us out of even what we can imagine. Like with time, I, I, I can relate to it as a human, as we did with our time models. With, but with the spatial models, like we're, we're always going to be contained in this body. So to jump out of that and see it from outside, maybe this book too, it kind of pointing at the sphere or whatnot. Um, does that make any sense? Yeah. Like, yeah. is he, is he an urgent, it seemed like Heidegger was more urgent. Like it, um, I've got to get this out, but it, from the tone I'm picking up for Slaughter Dyke, it seems like he's, there's no urgency. There's no, not necessarily no meaning behind it or just kind of like Ed might've mentioned, um, just sort of, He's throwing stuff all about and whatever. I don't care. I don't give a F. But uh, uh, well, yeah. he Heidegger's Heidegger's writing. I mean, like I said, I haven't read him, but I know he's writing in the 1930s in Germany. And Sloterdijk is writing. I believe this stuff was is between the end of the Cold War and before 9/11. Correct? When these books. I know they've been translated recently, but I think was they're it? like from that. 99 or 2000 or right this, around the turn. This is you know. published in 2014, but it was written the earlier. Yeah, that's what I meant. The translation yeah. I know is, is I know the, the first book was in 1999. I think this came out after 9-11, but maybe I'm wrong. You could, I'll have to look it up. But. In which case, you didn't know, he doesn't know much about 9-11. <laughs> right, right. But or, I'm saying that, you know, definitely so, yeah. we're talking about a different sense of urgency. Right. You know, right. and just, and just in the times that they're writing. And I'm very aware of like Occupy and Wall Street. I mean, I marched with them. I saw the Bloomberg paramilitary formations beating up people. <laughs> yeah, and I wow. saw uh, this is a very raw nerve. And, uh, and I think it did go, that did go global for a while. And now we're seeing Brexit and we're seeing Trump. And we've had this very interesting discussion on the Trump apocalypse. Yeah. And where are we now? And that's why I was drawn to this book because I thought maybe he has some models that would be of use. So I'm all for going back and looking at Plato, but I don't think he's a very good model for what's happening right now. You know, the philosopher kings and all that, and that totalitarian regimes, which, you know, and throwing out the poets and all of that stuff. I mean, Plato doesn't have a great track record, I think. And I don't think uh, Heidegger does either. When he was the head, the, the head of uh, all the graduate schools in Germany, you know, the rector, he, he did everything the Nazis wanted him to do. He, his own teacher, Herschel, could not use the, the library. <laughs> I mean, this is one of the rules that Heidegger made, even though he had Jewish friends. And I think, um, who's that? Fam uh, um, the famous uh, Hannah philosopher. Arendt. Hannah Arendt. Was, Hannah Arendt, he, yeah. was dating him at the time. He was a married man, but they were having an affair. So it, he was a very weird his performance was not spectacular. Um, although some people are very attracted to his writing, but I think a lot of people have let him off the hook. Um, so I'm looking for something else. And I'm hoping that, you know, studying the political philosophy and the history of it could be very illuminating if we're, if we have our eyes on the prize, you know, mm -hmm. and I don't know what's going to replace this, um, this uh, neoliberal fantasy that I think Obama's, administration the last year was just a mess. And um, he sort of set, set this up, I think. And the Clinton and Bernie Sanders and the very intense period for all of us, I think, but I'm sort of wanting to like, well, what's gonna happen next? Um, I'm looking for the rebirth, in other words, you know, the Phoenix rising. <laughs> I hope we haven't, we don't go into further uh, chaos. Because I don't think we're going to recover very quickly from that if we do. And anyway, that's... Slaughter Dyke has a bad reputation as well for some of these, not quite Nazism, but well, although he has been accused of that uh, almost. Uh, so he has, I, I, the jury's still out for me about the bottom of Slaughter Dyke's thinking. You know, and I think in some sense we're waiting to see how things will evolve with him. Have you I'm heard anything? I'm convinced that he's um, quite in the same wavelength as I am, for instance, or you are, for instance. Uh, we are. I, I, I'm not convinced of it yet, but uh, 
Um, and I do think, I, I wanted to come back to what you were saying, Johnny, about the becoming. And uh, uh, Slaughterdike doesn't talk a lot about becoming. He did a little bit in Bubbles. Um, but it was all focused on the dyad thing. Uh, but it's more about being right now. And a lot of the later stuff, I think, is also focusing on being he i noticed uh, tj you mentioned he he debunks all the philosophers but he actually names deleuze as one of those he he's not debunking <laughs> yeah, that's true yeah he had a, yeah, it was a nietzsche i think and and foucault and and deleuze yeah was and one deleuze was one of the ones that he sort of said <laughs> we give him a pass <laughs> right right oh. But Whitehead wasn't in the list. <laughs> right, right. He's not into process philosophy much, is he? I don't I haven't heard him quote any. I don't think so, but I, I do think that uh, the process philosophy is an important component to what, I mean, it certainly speaks to me, and it's more in Deleuze also who has a lot of that in his writing. Uh, and not very much in in Slaughter Dick. And I'm I worry. I I I understand the argument about Heidegger and time, and Slaughter Dick and space, but I worry that if we stay only in space, we're gonna miss the boat on the larger issues somehow. That if you just focus on space and relations in space. I don't know. I think you miss the broader structures of the universe, mm -hmm. which are space, spatial temporal structures, not yeah. only spatial or only temporal. And it comes back to the Klein bottle, which is a space time kind of structure yeah. rather process than process over structure. Yeah. So I worry about these things, but I'm, you know, I'm still, I'm still giving him the benefit of the doubt whilst we read forward on it. Right. But interestingly, go ahead, John. No, no, I was just agreeing with Jeffrey there. Yeah. I mean, you read him for what he's good at and what his focus on what his strengths are. And, um, you know, I can't blame him for not addressing issues that are personally relevant to me. I may need to go to somebody else for that. Um, but for what he does offer, you know, very erudite, real smart, very sensitive to beauty maybe a kind of static kind of version of beauty. He's not into rock and roll, <laughs> very much into chamber music. But I, you know, I, I share a lot of those enthusiasms with him so I can enjoy his, uh, you know, the polished surface that he presents. You know. But I wonder who's, who's having to clean the toilet while he's <laughs> so charming. <laughs> you know, there's, a, there's something someone said, this is a little vulgar. Um, the guy who wrote Dahlgren, he's a science fiction writer. Samuel Delaney. Samuel Delaney. He said, there's two kinds of people in the world. He says, there's a, a little bit of grunge on the toilet bowl behind, um, right in the middle of it. He said, there are people who know about that grungy area on the toilet bowl and those who don't. And I know a lot of the people because I've worked for them, the 1% here in Manhattan. They don't know anything about anything. You know, they just snap their fingers and it's there for them. I mean, I've been a, I've been a member of the servant class and they paid me very well and they were extremely nice people, by the way. But I think he's coming from that kind of, you know, ring the bell and someone's going to come and get something for him. So it's a very different way of operating. And um, so I understand why he may not feel a tremendous amount of urgency that other people do. And, but I don't think he's more those, he seems to imply that this, that these people who are disenfranchised and, and, um, you know, in earn these struggles are, are not aware of the whole. Whereas those who have the leisure time to reflect on it seem to be, have that opportunity. And I think he's wrong about that. I think there are people who are disenfranchised and, and dispossessed who are very aware of the whole. And how it and how it works, but they they're not to, unaware. They know how to function. You know, a lot of these rich people, if the elevator breaks down, they don't know what to do. You know, they're going to be in real trouble unless somebody fixes the elevator, and then they can get in and out and do their business. But I don't mean I'm, I don't mean to be. Um, I, I want to be 
balance about this so that I can appreciate, you know, that there are those with, with, with privilege and advantages that uh, use those advantages and privileges in, in ways that are of service to humanity, for sure. There have been plenty of, of people who've had privilege who did good things with that privilege. So I'm, and I'm, I'm hoping he's one of those, you know, but if he's talking about this anti-immigrant stuff uh, and, you know, this sort of, I don't know, I, I haven't followed that, that part of the, his discourse, um, but I've just heard that he's sort of a, I, anyway, I, I've said enough on this, I guess. But I guess that's where my uh, curiosity leads me. So I, I'm looking for loopholes. <laughs> How can we get out of this mess? Um, and I'm optimistic that we can, uh, if we sort of have some good models. I believe we can um, re-educate ourselves and recommit ourselves and move forward. And I'm looking for allies. I, I was I, I, I was hoping that he would be one of them when I started the the first volume, but I sort of gave up on that halfway through. We started <laughs> looking for other things to follow in his, his text, which I found. You know, I, I enjoyed the last read very much, but most of the pleasure of it was from your companionship with you guys, because you were all bringing something to the text that I often didn't notice. So maybe that will happen again here. So. Whereas I'm also seeing some of what Marco was talking about, where Slaughter Dyke He's, he, there's there's people who are unaware of how things function and they're unaware of the whole, you know, that's a kind of a um, portrait of people. But then if you go back to what he said in Bubbles, these same people are not unaware of their own personal dyads and relationships and the, the strong communities. That mean, yeah, that's all, that's all you have in the world, but you, know, you just kind of stick together in that. Um, and just going back to the space versus time, Slaughter Dyke's structures might not deal with time, but he's he's repeated it often throughout both bubbles and even into globes how um, fragile these spheres really are. So kind of time sneaks back in because they're not going to be here forever. Your person, somebody's going to die, and who you connected with personally in the microsphere and these macrospheres, nations crumble. Um, spheres pop they you, you blow even god you blow them out to an infinite an infinite expense where now you can't even reach him anymore and the, and the bubble goes away and you're constantly trying to find the next thing that's going to contain it you know so i think i, I don't think it he probably doesn't emphasize time but i don't think he throws out time altogether Let's pause for a moment because Heather Guster joined us and uh, I don't know, she, she doesn't have her uh, video or mic on, but if, uh, if she, oh, now she does. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I wanted to give you the chance to introduce yourself. We've been kind of going for about an hour and, and 10 minutes or so. Uh, and I talked a little bit about you because I, I saw that you had signed up and I thought you might be joining us. So I kind of talked you up. And uh, <laughs> cool. uh, lies. <laughs> <laughs> so, hi and hi. welcome. Uh, Thank you. Let me introduce you. Uh, we have Jeffrey. Uh, I don't know the order that they're all in or whether you see the names, but there's Jeffrey, uh, John, Day, John, TJ, Doug, and you know me, and you're Heather. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, thank you. I wish I yeah. could have my video on, but it's not working. So, so what brings you to Globes? Well, um, I had been interested in spheres, and I'm a little worried that I'll, I'll be in over my head, um, starting with globes. But, you know, I'm doing the IPS reading group, and we have some Slaughter Dyke scheduled. So I thought... Hey, what IPS is? Oh, yeah. Integral Post-Metaphysical Spirituality reading group. So um, I just started that as a way to um, find community for some reading. And since, uh, well... Yeah, I thought this would be a better place to do this kind of reading. And well, we're all in over our heads. So. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> well, just in the, I, I thought it started at seven. This call tonight, for some reason, I was thinking seven o'clock Mountain Time, but I see I was wrong. So sorry about that. That's okay. So, ha, do you have you picked up the book? Um, I can get a copy through the library by next week. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, where are we at? And 
Uh, well, we're just we're we're just getting started with the second volume. So this is Globes, uh, and I think uh, TJ suggested that a few pages that kind of summarize the bubbles, the first volume, and the path to get here. <clears throat> and um, you know, I think we could. You can get the sum the summary if you want to just uh, you know read along with us. Uh, part of what I think we want to talk about too is just how we want to conduct the group and like what we want to get out of the reading, how we want to support each other, uh, what we could bring to it. Like how could, if, if Slaughterdick is not necessarily like our ally, if he's not going to be there scrubbing the back of the toilet <laughs> be with us, um, but there's something, you know, we're on, we've, we're on this path of reading uh, these books uh, and, you know, I'm kind of conflicted about it, actually, still. More not, conflicted might not be the right word, but um, I've, I, have mul- I have multiple par- feelings about, about um, reading this, because I enjoy it a lot, actually. Mm. And I also am sensitive to and sense kind of what John's talking about, that, and Doug, too, has brought up, that is there an urgency to this? Is this helping does this, um, is this relevant to like our moment? And interestingly, I mean, Sloterdijk is the most contemporary, you know, big thought philosopher you can probably read, you know, now as far as somebody who has kind of stepped up on the world stage of philosophical discourse or whatever have you. And, uh, you know, he's alive now. He, he has thoughts on immigration. He has pr- positions and perspectives. And in a way we could, like in real time track the applicability of his thinking to real world events um, and see really how, 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 what we think about those and um, how those influence our own positions or perspectives. Uh, So I'd like it to, you know, I mean, the other thing too is the idea of spheres. If, if we're, if we're reflexive with that, then how are we uh, enacting or embodying what Sloterdijk is writing about? How, when are we coming together in a one orb? What's the center of this group? What are we, or if there isn't, then what holds it together? Uh, like we're, we're sort of creating a bubble in a way here. And so the fact that we're reading about it gives us an opportunity to be re- reflective about our own process and to learn something that is beyond just a theoretical understanding. It's something that we could embody or practice. So I, I, I've, I'm interested in doing that. I, I, I'm, like, I have a passion and love for philosophy, not because I just want to have a great picture of the world because I want to live in it more profoundly. And so that's, part of what excites me about reading this and at the same time as we've kind of been discussing in in our forum heather um you know there's like a lot of other things we all want to read we well, everyone has their own interests and their own obsessions and, and uh what really turns them on um so how how do those respective interests and viewpoints become part of a conversation and so that's what I'm, I'd love for you to share more about, like what you're really interested in, because uh, I know, and, and you know, John and TJ, they've been in dialogue, so we have a sense of each other. We've had a, you know, yeah. volume one and other things, but uh, I was telling about your poetry and Naropa and your work in rhetoric, and I just mentioned these things to give a sense for, you know, where you're coming from. But you'd be a much better person to describe yourself, obviously. Cool. Um, well, I'm excited about that. Um, sorry to break the bubble by being the new person. <laughs> um, so it's all about. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I thought I, I have to get a grasp for how bubble is being used because that might speak to something I've been curious about a lot. And uh, yeah, I, I'll have to do some catching up. That's my plan. But um, where do I want to go with this? I'm really interested right now in participatory spirituality. Um, and I don't know why it just seems to be the thing that I'm most drawn to. And it also seems relevant in a really interesting way because it bridges that gap between, 
um, being and being in the world kind of. And I'm not a philosopher by background. That will become apparent very quickly. I'm a pretty good reader. (laughs) Um, I read in different ways. I read kind of hermeneutically. I read um, poetically. I read against the grain with the rhetoric, um, focus on ideology. But I'm not as deeply conversant as a lot of people I know with philosophy. So uh, what else would you like me to say? You've already introduced my background. I'm curious about something. Could you, can you elaborate a little bit about rhetoric? Yeah. And why why rhetoric? Because I'm, I'm very fascinated by that topic. Cool. Yeah. Well, we just did a really cool, um, I should have invited Marco, a really cool salon discussion at the Integral Center in Boulder. So salons are like the Integral Theory and Practice Talks twice a month. And um, the topic was steel manning, which is Robert McNaughton's term for strengthening the position of the opposition so that you get it and it also eases the polarity and there's a relaxing and taking on of more perspectives. So in that, I got to talk for the first time in an integral context about rhetoric um, in some depth and the history of rhetoric. And um, I was drawn to it because I wanted to teach writing and I didn't trust myself as a writer when I was 21. So I went for the most professional degree I could. (laughs) I got my PhD in rhetoric and writing. Wow. Yeah. So I've been teaching. You're a doctor. You're Dr. Heather Fester. That's right. (laughs) Cool. I've been teaching higher education since 2001, which everything is rhetorical. You know, the first semester I taught, 9-11 happened. And I had to find a way as a 21-year-old to relate to 18-year-olds with some maturity about a tragedy the day it happened in the classroom. Um, So that was, you know, it kind of set the tone for my career. And right now I'm teaching uh, a series of essays where they're exploring 9-11. So, you know, from different perspectives, speeches and stuff. Um, what I love most about rhetoric is that it's inherently multi-perspectival and historically, I think this is really significant and fascinating. The fact that rhetoric was marginalized and, uh, kind of an outsider to philosophy because it did this practice and several other things that weren't respected, like rhetoricians sold their teachings and they were, (laughs) they wrote them down and that wasn't looked upon kindly and all these other things. But what they've done from the beginning is they've always said that the rhetorician is the good person skilled in speaking. So there's a sense that before you can persuade someone of anything or take any perspective, you actually have to have a grounding in moral philosophy. So that's raised interesting questions for me over time. I've really wanted to explore where those, who gets to determine who the good person or good man at the time skilled in speaking is like, Obviously, that excludes a lot of us in the history of rhetoric. Um, but that, those are some of the issues that continue to be interesting to me. And I'm going to write an article on integral rhetoric. So I'm just putting that out there. Maybe I'll be accountable if I announce it. <laughs> and, and could you talk about the relationship between rhetoric and poetry? Because that seems very interesting to me, too. Between rhetoric and poetry, you said? Yeah. Yeah. connected in interesting ways. Absolutely. Um, So not only did Aristotle write about both, right? (laughs) Or not write about so much as lecture on, but um, I think the thing that fascinates me most is the praxis, the, the actual, the way that they apply their theories about the world. And I do think they're distinct, um, at least in my practice, practice with them. So (sighs) rhetoric has a lot of, artificiality to it. If you look at a lot of rhetoric books, they're giant lists of what is bellatristic, what is aesthetically pleasing or motivating for the reader or for the listener to hear what will influence people. And they use tropes and they have, you know, all these figures of speech um, that are meant to be beautiful. And yet poetry goes straight into what is beautiful and says, what do I know from here? I think anyway, it's more, Um, For me, it's been more a process of letting go of my mind with poetry and getting into the heart um, or soul or self and just really um, learning to play again um, and learning to trace the outlines of my subjectivity or my relatedness. So those are some of the things I've thought about. I'd be interested to hear what you think, though. (laughs) 
Thank you very much. Thank you. You're yeah. welcome here because we really <laughs> need your help. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah, I think your skills will really balance a lot of uh, the gaps that I have. And one of the pleasures I found in this particular reading circle, in this study circle, uh, is that, you know, whatever gaps I have, I found other people can sometimes fill in those gaps for me. So it's, cool. it's great. <clears throat> thank you. Plato had some thoughts about rhetoricians and poets. And he sure did. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think of Schlatterdijk, I want to say one more thing about this guy. And that is he's a bit, to me, my metaphor for him, he's a speed bump. You know, I'm moving fast and all of a sudden, boom. <laughs> pick up another boom. So I have to slow down. And I have to confess that may be useful I have to sort of uh, go at his pace because he's certainly not going to go at my pace. <laughs> you know? He's very, very lots of long sentences, you know, and um, lots of question marks. You know, he'll he'll just he'll uh, a whole paragraph full of questions, which he proceeds to answer none of. <laughs> so I have to just sort of like I say. I have to sort of slow down and just deal with uh, his tempo rhythm, which is very leisurely compared to mine. But, you know, I just, I, I think that maybe there's a, a value in that. Maybe there's that. We've been talking about the power of now and the, that long now, um, rather than getting into the, those beta rhythms where everything's very fast and maybe a lot of, in, a lot of innovation happens there, but it's in those slower rhythms where there's power. So maybe that's, my bias, he's sort of bringing that to my attention. So, thank you. I also just like to say really quickly, uh, a lot of my my interventions in this in this circle of readers tends to call on my science expertise. But I also have another part of my life where I write novels, and we haven't talked about it at all. So having somebody who's <laughs> main interests are in poetry and rhetoric, I think will help bring up the other side of this, which is, uh, which I think we need. It's a little bit of the air conditioning you were talking about, Marco, I think, uh, <laughs> to air out some of the discussions <laughs> with some other elements, I think. <laughs> um, there's a new forum, Integral Poesia, which has been interesting to consider. Um, you know, the root in poesis and the making, the honing. Hmm. So maybe that's what we can uh, pull out a little bit with that focus. Uh, you know, Heather, I think I should offer just like a little bit of background to set context since part of this is that there, you're kind of coming in medias res. Uh, it's a good spot because we're also transitioning to another volume. But uh, we had, we did, nine just conversations on bubbles, one for each chapter and the associated uh, excursi. excursi. And uh, it was, uh, we, we had a mix of people. We had John Ebert on at first. Uh, we had a fellow named Ed Mahood uh, on, I think, all of the calls. And he played a particular role. He was sort of the critic and the curmudgeon, self, self-described curmudgeon in the group who really kind of held Sloterdijk to task in a way. Um, and so his spirit is somewhere in the air, if you will. There, we still have the, the, you know, he's still circulating in, in, in his, uh, his, his feelings uh, about, about the book. And in the forum, he's, he expresses them often. And that's been useful to like to read against Sloterdijk, you know, as much as to surrender to whatever he has to offer to uh, to find the value in in what he's really bringing forth. Um, having that multiplicity, I think, is really useful. And uh, like I was saying earlier, I'm interested in this as an a reflexive experiment as well. And so we've seen too how the bubble kind of inflates and deflates and differentiates and then fuses with some other like micro bubble or what have you. And we're using that term sometimes metaphorically. I, I think Sloterdijk, I think there's more to it. And um, 
and uh, like I've argued I, on the forum, I don't think that he's necessarily positing the sphere as the the correct uh, this, the correct shape for reality. But what I think he's doing and is sh- is showing how constitutive it is for our conditional reality. And so seeing that more clearly, I think for me at least is one of the things that is um, that I want, I want to explore further and kind of get to the bottom to get bottom of like, we talk about global capital and stuff and that that's like, he's describing that he's describing the, the ontogenesis of a, a globalized capitalistic world and also he's describing it at he's he's um how to put this tracing its ultimate demise that's interesting too because he's already calling the worldview the metaphysics that underlies and forms and structures this reality this consensus reality uh as expired and so that speed bump, John, might be the that sort of death deflation that, that, that we're all like experiencing. There's um, more than one speed bump, though. It's a <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, but the airbag only deploys once. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, w- I would like to suggest that we, because we've been on about an hour and a half, and we've tended to go about 90 minutes. Um, I'd like to open it up to discuss like how we want to do these calls, how often, kind of what speed we want to go at. Uh, we talked about it in the forum and I want to confirm that and maybe reiterate and confirm that with the folks that are, that are here. Um, so maybe I'll, uh, uh, I'm debating whether or not to read this, but uh, I will. But, uh, let's bring it back to the text and, and then talk logistics. Here, here's kind of what's at stake, I think, like, as far as the, what, the thinking of, or of globalization, the study of globalization. And this is why I think it's so cool. This, this excites me. Like I underline all this and write squiggly lines. He writes that global, globalization can only be understood by opening up to the realization that the thought figure of the orb is an ontologically and thus technologically and politically serious matter. Thinking means playing a part in the history of this seriousness. This serious history, very serious, this serious history is the history of being. Hence, being is not simply some time or other, but rather the time it takes to understand what space is, the realest of all orbs. And he goes on, the breakthrough to the concept of the actually existing orb brought the muddle of human history to its conclusion. So now he's he's talking about that philosopher's globe as the epoch in which the real lost in unclear fibers of time still had to be recounted and ushered in post history, the state in which space has absorbed time. All right. That might've been a little unclear. Let me, let me keep going. The rest of the paragraph after the stories, the simultaneous world, after the stories and the meta narratives, etc., the simultaneous world for those who recognized it, the orb triumphed over the line and the calm of essence over the twitchiness of becoming post history. So he's he's talking about now, therefore is as old as the philosophical theory of the orb. What this refers to today is the attempt to imitate on the terrestrial orb, what Plato had already demonstrated in the cosmic orb, relaxation in the apocalypse of space. Hmm. And what that, what I, the way I interpret that, is that what is the aim of globalization? Like, what is the aim of this economic system? Uh, econ- social, economic, political, ontological, technological system. What is it trying to do? What are we trying to do through it? And if what he is saying is right, then we're trying to create a state of perfect leisure for ourselves in a you know, perfectly secure uh, planetary system of some kind. Like that seems to be what he's pointing at, right? Like that sphere, the globe that we're kind of trying to create, what Plato imagined, 
global techno capitalism is trying to manifest. But there's an outside to that. And mm-hmm. so that more than tension, like that, that, that like tectonic uh, motion uh, between the inside of that envisioned and that manifest or manifesting sphere and what can't be contained in it. I mean, that's kind of, I think, what's at stake in, in this book uh, and the next. Uh, so, anyway, I don't know if we... And the spheres tend to collapse, so it might start off all embracing, but as it gets, it starts to exclude more and more people as it collapses inwards, you know, so... Well, I think when we're making a, a huge shift, whether personally or collectively, um, and when you're going to the edge of your map and you don't really have a map anymore i think you can take a leap into the unknown if you have a but you need to bring a few of those motifs um from the the cosmology you're exiting from Mm -hmm. so i think that maybe he could be providing a service because i think he's very aware of like these these relevant motifs that have repeated themselves um throughout our throughout you know western uh history and our attempts at creating a civilization i don't think we're quite there yet but so that i think would be a very or good orienting frame for myself to 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 revisit um you know plato and parmenides and the the, the pre-socratics and which he's very good at and the medieval the medieval world he's very sensitive to those uh He's very Eurocentric, though. I mean, he's not going to go, I think, into Eastern philosophy much. But So I think that's just my feeling of what I, I believe would keep me very motivated in reading him. It's like, oh, well, maybe that, maybe I can take that with me <laughs> into this next phase, into this turbulent phase space I think many of us are, are having to deal with to various degrees. Thank you. So what's next? Uh, it's almost the end of the year. Holidays are coming up. Uh, and it's a big book. And we've talked about trying to get through this one and the next by springtime or so. I haven't done the math on exactly how many pages that would entail. Uh, Were we talking about Aurobindo in the spring? Is that going to be something we were going to try for? We're talking about it. Yeah. Um. <laughs> I'm wondering if we could do one, this volume, and then go to the Arabendo. And then pick up maybe the final volume of the of Globe, uh, what, what, Phones. Mm-hmm. In um, maybe the, what would it be? The summer? Well, we might be tired of Slaughter Dick by the time we get to the end of flow. So that might be a good way to go. <laughs> oh, you want to do both of them back to back? No, I think it's too much. <laughs> but this is a big volume. I think it'll carry us through the spring. And then if you do our Rabindo in the in the late spring, that's another a big one too. But it's one that I'm very drawn to. Because I need uh, I need help with Oribendo. <laughs> He's very difficult. So that's just my feel that mm-hmm. this, if we focus on this one, and I don't mind, you know, big chunks of the text, and meeting a little more. I don't know. The, you you're very good at that, setting that up, Marco. I know. I know when we did Gebser, it was it was twice a week, wasn't it? It was very intensive. Yeah, uh, and I think yeah. we did it in three months. Yeah. It was, it was twice it, a week, yeah. It was a lot for that amount of time. I mean, Gebser Gip, is somebody we'll have to revisit again and please. again. Please. <laughs> uh, uh, and, 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 and that's kind of what I'm trying to think about is what's a larger trajectory? And, you know, what we all have our individual readings and our individual projects, uh, but it's good to have some things in common. But those things should be common. They, they should really feed into what we each want to do individually and collectively. 
Uh, so I like Aurobindo a lot. I'm, I, part of what I want to do is read these fundamental thinkers, you know, those who are in thinking about the whole. Uh, and uh, there, Aurobindo is certainly one of them. Uh, Heather has mentioned um, Roy Baskar. Uh, Michael Schwartz brought him up as well in a couple <clears throat> of our previous talks. I, I uh, like Baskar too. And, and there are uh, a universe of possibilities of, of think, thinkers we can read. Uh, and in a way, like reading all the reading globe spheres, excuse me, it was kind of a whim, honestly. Uh, I was attracted by the idea. That's all. Uh, I liked the idea of bubbles and thinking in those terms. And the metaphor was alluring to me. And it seems like no, you know, like, of course, yeah, sure, we could read a three volume you know, <laughs> philosophical. It's only what, 2000 pages. Uh, <laughs> and, but then you get into it. And he's really, a, he is, a, I'm convinced now, which I wasn't, necessarily after bubbles that he's a really serious thinker and i think that he, um he has a lot to, to say i do want to ultimately read all three volumes i'm i don't need to read them con, uh, consecutively uh and i don't know if that's the healthiest thing i think it's it, be, it would be very good to complement sloterdijk with uh, a variety of other not just philosophers but novelists poets uh experimental writers why do we have to stick to this one genre uh I, i'm curious more of what what it's adding to the overall mix or how it affects our our atmosphere our overall well, our atmosphere our cosmosphere well i think our benda would be a great i mean we're all comparativists here we like to compare contrast and compare and i think our benda is a uh, really into the superhuman the supramental there's a He's very much evolutionary um, kind of thinker, and which I think is very different from from Schlotterdijk or what I'm picking up from Schlotterdijk. So I think they would be uh, they would complement one another. Uh, I may be wrong, but I think that's a would be we a good thing find, to follow up. This we might also find that Aurobindo and maybe even other integral thinkers are recapitulating the same metaphysics that uh, Schlotterdijk is already. Um, tossed out dad yeah yeah uh, but he doesn't go into the east very much and Aurobindo is basically you know hindu mm -hmm. but he's also he was educated in the west so he knows latin and greek so i think he's a, he would be a very good contrast anyway you may be right i don't know but i don't think he's well let's get through globes first let's yeah i was set gonna up say some, a schedule to <laughs> put some kind of schedule together for um, globes, which I, I think I, I agree. John had brought this up in the forum too. I think we can do this in larger chunks, oh. you know, maybe like month, yeah. month, monthly get together, but like, like 200 pages at a clip yeah. and, you know, get it done in five sessions yeah. or so. Yeah. And this seems more readable than the last one to me. I, I I'm enjoying I it better. Yeah. I'm yeah. really, it's not refreshing. So it's refreshingly, you know, more to a, some, some kind of a point, you know, yeah. he's kind of, and he seems to be sticking with it. Like a, he, he started off bubbles though, with a very lucid and explanation of where it was going to go. And then it just kind of like lost it, but all over so, the place. We'll, 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 so we'll see. So I'm still kind of on the fence, but he, he's growing on me. He's growing on me. I have to say. <laughs> you have any thoughts, Doug? I just wanted to, chime in. Uh, I'm in the same boat with you, Heather. I, I have no knowledge. I have no books in front of me of Slaughter Dyke, and uh, I, might, I might keep it that way. <laughs> I'm debating whether to uh, go to the library and get the book or purchase a book. And Here's a little small one. This is Slaughter Dyke, The Art of Philosophy. Mm -hmm. This might be a good beginning. I haven't read it yet, but it's definitely something small. So I definitely like liked the idea of kind of sticking with where you guys are headed right now, uh, where we are headed and um, kind of go from there. <laughs> uh, what do you think, Jeffrey? 
Solder Dike is a bit like swimming in mud, right? It's like <laughs> you, you spend a lot of time working your arms, but you don't get very far very fast. <laughs> I, I say speed up, you say mud. <laughs> <laughs> uh. <laughs> it sounds like uh, we're all kind of conver- converging on this idea of maybe a once monthly then. Yeah, I think um, once a month is good. And so uh, we're here beginning of December. Uh, perhaps we should schedule something uh, the first Thursday, let's say, in January. Uh, that'll be, uh, where are we? It could be the first or second Thursday, depending on um, what you all have planned. So, so The first Thursday is the fourth. And the second be the eleventh. Would, would doing it the fourth be too soon after the holiday for anybody? No, no, no. It's okay. I'll be staying with friends, but I can do it from the friends' place as well as here. So, okay. Quick question, Marco. How do you communicate with us? Do you send email or is it a? Well, I haven't done a great job, honestly. <laughs> um, we yeah, uh, we're mainly in the forum. Uh, there's a uh, okay. infinite conversations. There's a channel or a category for spheres specifically. So uh, for each event, typically I uh, post a topic with the time and the zoom link there. And uh, you know, like I haven't got, been very consistent about emailing and okay. social media, etc. I, I just, I've, I've, um, reducing my overall cognitive social load. And so trying to focus as much as possible on, uh, the, you know, what I actually, the matter at hand. So if you just check in there, um, you could also add you to the group and then I think you should get notifications even by email. Okay. Uh, Sounds good. Posted. Or I can, you know, I'll tag you or I'll tag the group and then you'll get a notification. Okay. Uh, and then we've also used that to follow up too, like on uh, on the individual talks, either leading up to or afterwards uh, to articulate thoughts that maybe we didn't bring in or build on thoughts that might have you know, arisen during the course of a, of a talk. And, you know, there too, it's a sort of different pace, I'd say, uh, than um, say a Facebook group or like, it's, I don't know if it's slower necessarily. It's, it's pretty intense. <laughs> It, it's a different time, different time space, uh, and and also one that you know we're cultivating. I'd say, like, and that's part of the idea is to cultivate a discursive space that is cumulative in a way that builds a body of thought and that like can grow over time. Like Doug just now is picking up Gebser, and we have all those threads from literally the, uh, from the, the reading. <laughs> Now, a couple of years ago, almost, is it's going to be. Uh, so, I'd like to go through Gebser, too. You may have a dyad. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah, I, I followed, I'll read him again. <laughs> I, I, I followed Doug's post this today. So, I think that was great what you posted, Doug. So, I'm interested. I'll go back and read it. Yeah. I don't think I can read Gebser and Slutterdick at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's in the archive, so it's always an option. That's right. Uh, in a way, I mean, part of the inspiration is also a kind of time-free space. Uh, the Gibsarian um, dimension, kind of beyond the mental uh, acceleration and uh, hyper, you know, intensification of moment to moment. Like, how can we let thoughts kind of unfold? over more time. And part of that is also in a way creating an, an alternative to the social media sphere that like, I've had, I've really tried to just had to distance myself from because it was driving me crazy. And uh, I have found my thoughts of, well, anyway, this is no, that's a whole nother conversation. I'd love to have it sometime, but um, I guess we're agreed then on next month. First Thursday, so uh, I will 
post the recording of this. That's another thing. We, we record these, we post them so folks can watch them afterwards and we could also reflect on our own uh, process. And uh, what we've also done is that each time, and this has been, I thought, useful, somebody bleeds it off. So they will begin with a summary or a take or a, a question or what have you. And we've taken turns doing that. And that's been a way to, of structuring it and kind of um, circulating leadership around the group. So uh, I kind of did that today. I could have probably done a better summary than I did. Uh, but I wasn't sure where we were all were going to be at in, in the reading. So whatever. Um, would somebody like to volunteer to lead us off next time? Uh, and even, yeah, we'll have to decide exactly what we read, but let's say up to chapters two or three or something like that. Anyone, anyone? I'll go. I don't, I haven't done it before. So I, I guess it's my turn. Someone's got to do it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't imagine myself coming up with something, but I wouldn't mind just maybe putting together something. Do you want to do it, Doug? <laughs> you can. I'm not, I, I might I not even do the reading, so uh, we'll, we'll see what happens. But yeah, I can I can take it up. Okay, why don't you do it then, if you want to do and it. And see what happens from there, and then somebody have an actual backup who actually read the book. So. Oh, I think you should read it if, you, if you're going to lead it. <laughs> you I know, should. I'm just messing. Okay. Um, but, so count me out. I'm sorry. Oh, okay, so you're not sure you're going to read it, so you shouldn't. So you're not going to lead Correct. it, or you're Correct. just fucking with me. <laughs> I will not be the one to present. Okay, so then John. Okay, I'll right. read it and I'll present something very brief, like that'd be fun. Thank okay, you. and and like it doesn't have to necessarily be a summary of the text. I mean, it's helpful to refer back to the text. I think it's important to refer back to the text and ground the conversation in what he actually said. But like I did when I when I started talking today, I, I referred to an I a, referred to an anecdote, uh, the s- sculpture that I saw in a park of a, of a globe and what that made me think and feel, etc. I tried to anyway. Uh, we're very open, so. No. Uh, that's that's what the experimental spirit is part of what we're trying to circulate in our atmosphere, if you will. Anyway, I think I'm out of steam. Group, right? I, think, I think my bubble is deflated. <laughs> we can trust the group to help lead us through these things. So. Yeah, uh, if without the group, I don't think I would have read any of this, honestly. Uh, so. That's the other thing is that when I know that a discussion is coming up, I'll, I'll read more carefully and take more notes and really try to form my, my, my perspectives that 99% I don't even get to, to bring them in. Uh, but the, just the knowledge that we're going to be talking seems to focus attention. So uh, that's useful. Great. Yeah. Are we good? Thank you. Any, uh, any last words from anyone? It's been a pleasure. <laughs> happy holidays, everybody, and happy yeah, new happy year. Holidays. <laughs> happy and holidays. Also. Thank you. Thank Take you. care. Hey, nice we'll seeing you, Doug. Doug. Nice meeting you, yeah. Heather. <laughs> nice to meet you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> all right. We'll see you all soon. Bye. Bye. Great to have some new people. So. <laughs>